This is another LBR at your LBS video, and today we are at the Bicycle Man here in Alfred, New York. This video is brought to you by TerraCycle, makers of exquisite parts and accessories for your bent. All right, what do you say we head on inside, talk to Peter Stoll, and find out exactly what goes on at the Bicycle Man shop. Let's go. Gary, how? Oh, we're on, eh? We're on, oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's great to be at the Bicycle Man. Peter, what do you say that we uh, have a look around your shop, maybe have a little chat and talk about uh, the history of the shop and your history and uh, maybe a little test ride later on? What do you think? That sounds like fun. Let's do it. Good. Okay, Peter, so here we are ensconced in a couple of nice trikes. Uh, we got an avenue there that you're sitting on, and mine is a... Uh, cat trike villager. A cat trike villager, yeah. very nice. All right, let's uh, start with a trip back in time. I know you're not that old of a guy, probably don't go back that far, but tell me a little bit about the very beginnings of your association with Bikes. Well, in 1966, I was 11, and I was helping a friend clean out his parents' garage. And his mom came out and said, first thing you have to do is throw out these two bikes. And I borrowed their phone and got my mom to drive the Rambler up and take the two bikes home. I stripped one for parts and fixed the other and rode around a bit, but I already had a bike of my own. So I put it out front with a hand-painted sign that said, for sale. And a guy stopped by, the first car to stop, gave me $13 cash money. And in 1966, for an 11-year-old, that was really cool. And did you really know at that time that you wanted to kind of go in this direction in terms of like being, at least being in the bike industry? No. No, I was uh, just trying to make a couple bucks. As a matter of fact, my previous business experience was uh, selling atomic fireballs in, the, in uh, middle school. And I would, uh, I would, you know, go at the go to the grocery store and buy them for a penny a piece and sell them for two cents at school. Well, one one day I was running out of fireballs, and word got around that I was running out, and people started to offer me nickels and dimes and quarters. So from then on, they started a nickel. <laughs> the light bulb went off. Yeah, then I realized. See, that's how I learned marketing. All right. So uh, from those early days, uh, tell us how did you get into selling recumbent bikes? Uh, my wrist got sore. I was racing bikes. I'd been racing for a while, and I didn't have a, a driver's license, so I was riding a lot of miles, and the pounding of the handlebars, I'm leaning in the handlebars, my, my wrist got sore. And in 95, I finally got where I wasn't riding anymore, and I bought a Rans Rocket. And actually, I called up, uh, I called Vision, and I called Rans. I was trying to decide between the two, and I, I called Rans one time, and Randy answered the phone. And I said, you know, I'm trying to decide, pick my first recumbent. I'm trying to decide between a Rocket and a Vision R40. And I'm kind of leaning toward the Vision because it's so versatile. It can be above seat or below seat, long wheelbase or short wheelbase. If I get it and I don't like it, I can change it. That, that's kind of neat. And Randy said words that proved to be so true. He said, yes, it's very versatile, but it's not designed to do any one of those things really well where the Rocket is. And I bought the Rocket, and I loved it. Gosh, that just was rock my world. That thing was a wonderful bike. And I, you know, people ask me if I still ride traditional bikes. I say, oh, absolutely. You know, somebody brings in a bike and says it makes a funny noise in fourth gear. I go ride it. So yeah, it makes a funny noise in fourth gear, and I get back on my recumbent. I don't ride. I don't ride bikes. <laughs> okay, so then how did that lead to you getting into the business of selling recumbents? Well, I've been selling diamond frame bikes. I've been making a living selling traditional bikes since 75, late 75. And, uh, you know, it was a, it was a full-time job. By the 95, it was a full-time job. It was a one-man shop, but it was a full-time job. And uh, if I had a recumbent bike, people that came in looking for a bike, I showed them my recumbent bike, and they all said that that was too much money. At that time, it was what, $900 or something, and that was too much money. So the next year I got a bike E that was $700 or so, and I got a few people to take a test ride in the bike E but didn't sell one. The next year I got a Maxim recumbent, uh, and they had the distinction of going out of business as the recumbent two-wheel market took off. They were a thoroughly mediocre bike. 
Um, but I sold that one because well, that was like $425 or something. And I sold that, and the next year we sold five, and the next year we sold 10, and we put all our money into inventory. And then, you know, before, in, well, in 2001, I went to the, uh, the New York Bike Show, which was in the World Trade Center, so I clearly can tell it was not after 2001. And uh, I took 12 recumbents in our van. And while I was there, it was over half of our inventory was in the van. And while I was there, I joked and said that we had a larger selection of recumbents in the van than all the shops in New England and New York combined. All the other shops in New England. Because there was just, it was a vacuum. Nobody was doing anything at that time. Tell well, us about, yeah, tell us about the, the, uh, uh, the genesis of that uh, first shop and then, uh, and then bring it up to date and tell us about coming here. Well, the first shop was in my parents' basement. The second shop was in a dorm room. The third shop was in Willie's house. And Willie, Willie taught in a one-room schoolhouse, and he never lived in a house with electricity. And Willie's stories go on for a long time, so I'll, I'll cut that a little bit short. He was a pretty neat guy. And uh, then the next shop was a pizza shop that we converted. And the next shop was an 1849 schoolhouse we converted. And the, for those previous shops had been... Uh, a few years each, but the 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 schoolhouse we converted that we always there uh, from '79 till 2009 or 10, 2010. So it was 31 years there, and uh, then we finally outgrew that building. We built additions on it and ran out of land, and and then this place came up for market. And the neat thing, actually, it wasn't this place was never on the market, but I was riding by one day. And uh, the lady that owned it was out in the yard. And I rode up and I, I stopped and said, Barbara, you know, if you'd ever consider selling the place, I'd, I think the, the, the chicken barn would make a great bicycle shop. And she looked at me like an old country farm wife would. And she said, I still think of it more as a home than an investment. And I said, well, good for you, but, you know, if you, if you ever change your mind, let me know, and we would give you lifetime use of the house. She said, well, come on in. She moved in in 1949 as a bride, and somehow she'd gotten attached to it in the meantime. Well, the other thing interesting about this was that Barbara gave me those first two bikes. It was her garage I was cleaning out. <laughs> so I haven't come very far in this business. The red barn to here is, what, 150 feet. Uh, and we bought it in 2008 and remodeled it and moved in in 2010. Now we have lots of space. We have four acres we can build on. I am never going to move the shop again. Okay. When we moved to this building, it's about a half mile downhill from the old shop. We rode all the bikes. Tell us, tell us about some of the unique features of this and how you do business. Well, one of the things uh, is that our staff has a lot of experience. Uh, you put us together, we've got well over 100 years experience in the bike business. The the three of us that are most experienced. So the, I have 52 or whatever you want, depending on when you want to count, 53 years or something since I sold the first bike. And I've been constantly selling and repairing bikes since then. Uh, Lee has got around 40 years experience and Ben has got 15 or 16. And then Stuart has been in this, he's worked for us for eight or nine years and you know, yeah, it adds up. So you get, you walk in the door and you talk to people who know what they're talking about. What about uh, what you have on the floor? So your, uh, the inventory that you have is, as you can see over our shoulder, is uh, pretty uh. extensive. And uh, you might notice uh, above our heads, going all the way back as well, you have some things hanging up there. Um, tell us about the inventory uh, of the bikes and trikes you sell, and tell us a little bit about what's going on over our heads here. Pretty much everything is over our heads, but... We, we sell, uh, oh, it depends from, from year to year as companies come and go, but we have uh, over a dozen brands in stock, and we typically have, you know, our website, I think it says that we have uh, 100 bikes in stock, 100, 100 recumbents. At the moment, I'm pretty sure it's 200. Um, if you, you know, because we manufacture linear recumbents, and we import, we design and import the Avenue trikes. Um, so with those two, yeah, it's, it's 200. But if you come in the showroom and you look at different trikes that we have on the floor ready to ride, we probably have 40 or 50 different trikes ready to ride and uh, 30 or maybe two-wheel recumbents ready to ride. Tell me about what's over our heads here. Well, we have a recumbent museum. 
Uh, started as a collection, but people are starting to call it a museum now, so who am I to get in their way? Uh, we have about 55 recumbents. Um, we only have room for about 35 in this building, so the others are being stored elsewhere. We, we don't rotate the collection much because it's kind of a chore, but a little bit. Um, we just recently got in an early long bike slipstream, which is just at the transition from Ryan, and it actually has this Ryan steering linkage on it, a stainless steel Ryan linkage. It's, it's interchangeable with a Ryan. So that's sort of a neat moment in time there, right. you know. And as you can tell, folks, you know, these are not just historic bikes uh, that are hanging over our head. They're historic stories that Peter has in his head. And every one of them is something that he could tell you about at length. Beautiful uh, hanging collection that is a museum. So it's a, it's a reason to come to the bicycle shop, even if you're not necessarily looking to buy something, really worth the trip just to check out uh, what Peter's got here. And they're all labeled nicely as well. Uh, the history right over our heads are very interesting. Now, I think maybe we, at this point we can, uh, I think, uh, go to the question of manufacturing because this is something that most retailers don't get into and something that you've taken on. So, Peter, if you could, uh, let's start with uh, linear because I think that's the beginning of the story. Yeah, in 2002, linear went out of business and we, yeah. we, we bought their assets and uh, we brought them to New York. Um, and they had some engineering problems, but I thought we could fix those. And they had some business model problems, and I thought we could fix those. So we've done a lot of engineering and uh, spent a lot of time at it. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, people would ask me, well, why did you buy a bicycle manufacturing business, you know, at, uh, in your mid-40s or, or late 40s? And I said, you know, people my age, guys my age, sometimes have a midlife crisis that involves, like, you know, a convertible or a red, a blonde, you know? And uh, my midlife crisis involved bicycle manufacturing, but I have a pretty good chance of getting my money back on this one. A couple years ago, we switched from making welded frames to making folded frames. And uh, that's pretty neat. It makes it a lot easier to carry a bike. So uh, uh, a linear, long wheelbase linear recumbent will fit in a Corvette, for instance. But there's another reason to make uh, a linear smaller and fit into tinier things, and that's your latest development. Tell me about that. Well, the, we took the linear limo and we put together a, actually we had a, we had a customer call us up and he wanted to carry it in an airliner. And we, you know, he, he's a, he travels a whole lot for business and he wanted to take a bike with him. So we said, well, we'll add this option, this option, that option, and then you can carry it in an airplane. And we sold him one, and he loves it. Gosh, he, he, he's been on Bent Rider Online writing about it, and he, he really likes it. So he emailed me, and he said, you know, you build a really nice bike, but your marketing really stinks. So what you need to do is instead of saying, here's a Chinese menu, and if you buy all of these things, then you can, he said, just come out with a new model that fits in a plane. It's the same bike, just, just call it a new model. So the linear airliner was born, and uh, it's a linear limo, limo with a foldable seat, and uh, a 20-inch rear wheel. Now, we have luggage it fits in, and it's a package deal. We're still working on You'll see when we go out to the machine shop, you'll see we're working on some packing material for it. To a disc, we're just, Right now, we're manufacturing disc brake protectors, uh, reusable things there, so that's kind of fun. And then there is another product that you manufacture. You got into trikes, if I'm not mistaken. And well, getting out of another shirt, yeah. See? Yeah, there we go. So uh, <laughs> the Avenue is what we're going to talk about. Tell us about Avenue Trikes. Uh, it, the Avenue Trikes began about 2012. Uh, the trike market was taking off, and Lee kept telling me we should design a trike. We can make a bike, we can make a trike. And, and I, so I, we started looking around, and I asked Lee, what are the features that people look for that aren't available at a price point. And we made a list of features that people wanted and we couldn't find at $1,500. And they wanted a robust trike that had a padded seat and had decent handling and had 24 gears so you could climb hills. And uh, we put the Avid brakes on it so it's easy to adjust because there are some less expensive brakes, but there are some nightmare stories about trying to adjust them. They can be really awkward. so. Everybody knows how to adjust the Avids. All, all bike shops know how to adjust Avid trikes, Avid brakes. So, so we did that, and it became Avenue Trikes, and now we're uh, 
now we're having new trikes. And we're, having, we're, uh, we're filing a patent in the next month or two on a, uh, the next model, which will have a folding frame. Okay. Well, we'll be looking for that. That's interesting. Now, you have also developed a, a dealer network. This is not just something that you're selling here or directly to customers. Uh, you've got these uh, placed in various uh, shops around the country, yes? Yep. This year we'll sell more Avenue trikes through dealers than we do direct. So that'll be a first for us, right. which is neat. That's great. And so this next one that you're talking about, you'll have a ready-made, uh, hopefully, dealer network for you to yep. go to with that. All right, Peter, that's that's great. So I think if it's okay with you, what do you say we uh, get up and uh, take a little stroll around uh, the Bicycle Man and, okay. and see uh, if you can give us a little tour of what's here? Sure. Sounds good. Okay, Peter, let's, uh, let's have a look then at what you have on the floor here. Okay, well, we'll start up front. We have some ice adventures and an ice sprint. We've got full suspension, rear suspension, and no suspension in stock, and electric. Uh, then we have some cat trikes. We typically stop at, stock every cat trike except the 700 and maybe the Expedition. Uh, folding has become popular, so the Expedition has been a slow model for us. Uh, we have the Azub trikes. We have the HP Velo. Uh, we have the Greenspeed Magnum. And we have the Avenue trikes. We have Terra Trike. Uh, we stock a few models there. And we have the electric Terra Trikes. What's uh, right behind us here? What do you have? Well, we have uh, the Terra Trike Rover Tandem. We have a Sun Tandem used and a Vision Tandem used. And then we have our Delta Trikes. We have a couple Sun, a steel and an aluminum Sun, and we have two of the Haza Trigos. Very good. Peter, we moved on to uh, the next aisle here uh, at the Bicycle Man, and what do we have for sale here? Well, on this side, we have uh, recumbent two-wheelers. We stock quite a few of those. We have the linears, and we have some long bikes and long and short wheelbase rands. We have HP Velotechnic and Bacchetta and Lightning and Azub and Sun. And here's Orion and Easy Racers, and there's a Rans Crank Forward. And then we have some uh, Burleys, and some more Rans, and another a Long Bikes Long Wheelbase. So those are the selection of uh, two-wheelers that we have, and that you know selection varies from time to time. We have new and used recumbent, so obviously if anyone that's been paying attention the last 20 years, Two or three of the brands I just mentioned are no longer in business, but we still have used ones in stock, and they come and go, and, you know. A great, a great option for someone who just want to uh, start out in the recumbent uh, two-wheelers, say, for instance, yep. and see what it's like. Especially, I think, a used bike is a good idea if you, you know, if someone calls us up and they live in a state where there are no dealers and they're not going to drive or fly to a dealer, which the ideal thing is to drive or fly to a dealer and spend a couple days test riding everything they've got. Ride, you know, you want to try, if you're looking at two wheelers, you want to try a long wheelbase and short wheelbase. You want to try above sea steering and below sea steering. If you're looking at three wheelers, you ought to try Delta and Tadpole, high seat, low seat, a variety of stuff. Uh, direct steering, indirect steering, so that you have, a, have an impression. So to ride a variety. And, you know, if you a larger dealer, it may take more than one day to do that. If you're not going to test ride, it's a good, and, and, you know, you call us up and you're not going to go somewhere to test ride. Okay, we will ship you a bike, but we recommend you start with a used one because it won't depreciate as much as a new one. So if you get a bike and a month later, yeah, maybe you're going to take a roll of the dice again and try something else. Wouldn't it be nice to not have lost a lot of depreciation on a used bike like you would in a newer one? And how about uh, behind us here, Peter? What do we have? Well, we have the Day 6 Crank Forwards, and we have the Max Area Recumbents, which are, if you like the Bikey or the Vision R35 or the Big Ha or the Cannondale or the Giant Revive, 
Okay, those are all out of business, but Max Area still makes a very similar bike, and it's nice. And then we have the Day 6 crank forwards, and at the moment we have a Rans crank forward, too. The Rans is a much lighter, sportier crank forward than the Day 6. The Day 6 has a low step through, which is an option available on the Rans, and it has a seat back support, a lumbar support, which a lot of people like as an option that's not available on the Rans. Peter, you also uh, carry in the shop a number of accessories, and I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what you have here. Okay. Well, we have a variety of bags, panniers and seat bags, and, uh, particularly recumbent-specific bags. We have some non-recumbent-specific bags because their price points are typically better. And then we have a bunch of accessories for ICE and HP Velo and TerraTrike. Uh, we have some generic accessories. We have racks and fenders and pretty much everything that you want to put on a bike. Um, then we have adaptive stuff. We have uh, uh, adaptive pedals and, you know, the parts to do one-hand controls and a variety of stuff like that. We have flags and spinners and we have a variety of seats. We have actually quite a collection of different seats. For uh, We have some from bikes that are no longer made. We have new ones to fit bikes we currently sell. Uh, we have you know, variety like the linears alone, there's five or six seats that fit a linear. So those are all available. Well, this is one of the rooms that we do assemblies in, Gary. Okay. We've got a trike stand here and a double park uh, bike stand. And so we assemble most of the trikes. We have two rooms that we do uh, bike and trike assembly here. And we have one room that's just linears. We'll show you that in a little bit. We'll just assemble linear there. This room, Gary, is, uh, this is Lee's room. Lee's our store manager and head mechanic, and he does the more complicated installs here. He does the electric work, uh, electric assist. He's got a bike stand and a trike stand. He does a lot of our wheel building also. He has this, the uh, spoke machine, which is pretty neat. You can cut spokes to fit anything. So we can make spokes to fit a 16-inch wheel or a 12-inch wheel or Pretty much anything. It's yeah. kind of neat. Yeah. It, it was a lot easier than stocking every size spoke in two or three qualities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the linear room. This is where we assemble all the linear recumbents after they're all manufactured. This is a roadster that's going together. It's a this is a small. It'll fit someone from about four foot eight up to five foot six, or depending on leg length, something like that. And here's some seats that are ready to. They've been uh, put our brackets on. They're ready to go on bikes. Uh, this is an above seat steering that we're we're trying. We've got it. We have, we're, we do above seat steering in the linears also. We're not well known for, but we do. And this is just a different above seat uh, bracket we're we're thinking about using. It has a tilt like the others do. So we're thinking about that. Okay. And now that we're doing the airliner that uh, folds up to go in airplanes, we thought we'd make some uh, reusable packing material. So we came up with this. And this is a disc brake protector. So you you split it open like that and put it over there and it, it won't come back off. And that way if something hits the disc in shipping, it protects the disc. And it's right. very, very expensive material. Yeah. It's a six inch sewer pipe. All right, where are we now? So this is a stock room. This is where we store all the stuff that doesn't need to be kept warm in the winter uh, and bulky stuff. These are adaptive pedals here. And this is the welded linear frames. We don't manufacture those anymore, but we have a lot left, so they're still available. Uh, bikes that need to be assembled are over here and uh, wheels hanging from the ceiling. Tires on the racks over here. This is all you see recumbent seats up there. We got a long bikes and a linear and a burly and a bikey on that top row. And this is, a, let's see, this one is a Pachetta and that one is a uh, HP Velo. Okay, where are we going next? Let's go back into the machine shop. Let's do it. Okay, so lots of uh, really interesting looking equipment here. What do you got going on here in the machine shop, Peter? Well, we've got two lathes and a bandsaw, a drill press, a sander, and two milling machines. Uh, our, nice, our nicest piece of equipment is the Bridgeport milling machine. One day I was working on something on the little milling machine and Lee came in and interrupted me and said, no, you wanna come talk to this customer? And I said, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Doesn't we get finished this one part? And 
He said, no, you want to come talk to this guy? I said, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. He says, he's buying a trike and he wants to trade. He's wondering if we would take a Bridgeport and trade. I said, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we traded a Terra trike for this bike, for this uh, this machine. He he brought it in. We, we wheeled it in through the front door. I am the, we, we built this. This part was an addition and I designed and we built this, okay? Now, I have to admit, I'm the guy that designed a machine shop without an exterior door. So we brought this bridge port in the front door, down the hall, and through this door. That was yeah. not the so way. So that design decision yeah, haunts was, you to this yeah, day. Terrible, bad, <laughs> bad idea. So here we're on this lathe. Uh, this is our bigger lathe, and we're turning sewer pipe into disc bake protectors here. So it's a pretty neat process, but uh, we're gonna we got some plastic shavings to clean up as soon as we're done with that step. All right, Peter. Uh, Clearly, we look like we're ready to take a ride. Right, I'm ready. All right, so this is a, a test ride. This would be hopefully very close to what someone would uh, would do if they're taking a test ride that came here to the Bicycle Man, yes? Yep, we're gonna go down the back road we send people on, which is, uh, you'll see how heavily traveled it is. All right, you haven't scared me yet, so okay. are you ready to go? I'm ready, let's, let's do it.
Well, something's gotta give today. It's a good day today and not tomorrow. There's no time to borrow today. Well, something's gotta give today. It's a good day today. It's a good. here with uh, Peter and uh, with Phil and uh, Peter's going to show us uh, today how he would fit a tricycle for someone that has some sort of adaptive uh, need and we're going to start with Phil who has a right prosthetic leg and uh, Peter could you kind of run through the process of someone coming in like Phil how would you uh, how would you get him set up on a trike well if I was going to set Phil up uh, and he had one prosthetic leg. Now, the, the problem with his prosthetic leg is that, well, first off, he's clipping into the pedal. So often people with prosthetics have trouble holding their foot in the pedal. And if they don't want to use a clip-in, then we have adaptive pedal. Just put an adaptive pedal on. That works pretty well. And then uh, you can do that. But the problem that Phil's been having is that he can't bend his right knee as much. So he put a crank arm shortener on the right leg, which makes sense. Now the right leg doesn't bend as much. But if there's not a leg length discrepancy, mm -hmm. I would put the shorteners on both cranks or just put on shorter cranks, which is the simplest thing. I mean, it's, you have to readjust the gears and stuff with the new cranks, but that's, now you're not calling around this extra hardware, which is not inexpensive. And it's, gives you, it widens your cue factor a little so the pedals, your, your feet are farther apart side to side, which mm -hmm. some people like. Okay, there's, you can, there's another adaptive thing. Some people intentionally move the pedals farther apart. Maybe their ankle is hitting the crank arm. Okay. So they put what's called knee savers on. Okay? See, I'm not sure why they call them knee savers, because it's really for your ankle. But whatever, sometimes your knee, you, you can have knee pain problems because it's misaligned. Angles, and yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. um, so what I would suggest is, uh, first off, I would take this off. Now that you've broken in your prosthesis and your swelling is down and stuff, I would mm -hmm. take the crank shortener off and see how it goes. And if, it, right. if it bothers, especially when, you've just, when you get a replacement prosthesis, maybe uh, put a pair of crank shorteners on for a while until you can take them off again. What are the more common types of uh, adaptations you do on trikes? We do a lot of single hand controls. Uh, we do a lot of, like a, a stroke person is going to have uh, hemiplegia, we're going to put an adaptive pedal on one side and then move all the controls to the other side. Um, sometimes, sometimes somebody needs two adaptive pedals. They, if they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, nerve loss in their feet, they can't feel their feet. They can ride, but they can't feel their feet. If you can't feel your feet, your feet are going to fall off the pedals, and that's not a good thing at all. So then we'd put a pair of the, the adaptive pedals on. Phil, let me ask how long you've had your prosthetic device. About three quarters of a year. Okay, so it's had time to, you've had time to adjust and the swelling's gone down, like Peter said, so that's where he is with this. Okay, go ahead, Peter. How many miles have you ridden since the prosthesis? Maybe 50. Oh, 50 miles, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's really that, we haven't got, you really don't have much experience yet on the, on the prosthesis no. riding. Okay, so it's early in the curve and, you know, you're going to find something that'll work well for you. And uh, uh, I would also suggest if you, Another possibility would be a pedal pendulum or a pedal swing, and that allows you to keep your legs the same distance, the same length, where this one shortens one leg. The crank shortener shortens one leg, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, the pedal pendulum or the pedal swing allows you to keep your legs the same distance at the end of the stroke, but the one leg doesn't come up as far. And some people like those real well, and some people don't like them as well. So. I, th I think some of the higher performance riders don't like him as much. Peter, let me ask you, uh, so Phil's come here, but he's brought his own uh, trike. He's got a Cat Trike 700 here. But I'm going to guess that most people that uh, require a trike fitting are probably coming to you maybe without a trike at all. So if you're starting right from, uh, from ground zero on this and they come to you uh, with a situation, say, like Phil has, how are you, how is it different uh, helping them choose a trike uh, for someone with an adaptive need versus just anyone walking in? 
just a little more a little more involved. Sometimes, you know, someone that has no arms at all and wants to steer with their torso, okay, that's more complicated. But, you know, if you can if you can stand up and even if you're in a wheelchair, if you can transition to a trike, you can ride a pedal power trike. Okay, and people, well, I'm in a wheelchair, I need a hand trike. Well, maybe. Okay, if you have no sensation or use of your legs, yeah, you need a hand trike. But if, you, if your legs are weak due to uh, MS, say, but you can still feel them and you can still transition, you have some use of your legs, you're probably better off to ride with your legs, is my opinion, because your legs are much larger muscles. And the larger muscles in your legs are gonna be capable of exercising your heart and lungs and getting your pulse up. But I would say for Phil, uh, the next thing I would do would be to take this off and have him ride some and see how his knee feels. And if it bothers, uh, I would recommend next would be to go to either crank shorteners on both legs or just shorten the cranks a little bit. But the, you know, I guess if you're coming due for another, uh, another prosthesis change, then this is maybe about as good as it gets. I mean, we don't know, maybe a year from now it'll be even more better, okay? We don't know, more better, that's... Yeah. That's right. really good, more yeah, better. More better. More so, really so you're, w the point is that at this, at this junction, so Phil should probably just keep riding and riding more and see how it all works yeah, out for him. Yep, that's okay. what I would do. That's but if, 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 uh, if you're about due for a prosthesis, this may be as good as your leg gets, which means I, and if you can't ride it with just the stock cranks, then I would make a permanent change to the trike and shorten both crank arms. And you've got 165s now. We've got 155s, 152 and a half, and 145s in stock, and you can have custom ones made. Okay. So those there's a lot of options left here. It's not like oh this didn't work and now what do I do? Well, there's still we got a bag of tricks that we haven't even opened yet. Okay, so we're we're good. We got lots of room to work. So I'm going to take this uh, adaptive uh, crank shortener off and make you go out and do some riding. See what you think. So now you're going to get full extension with this leg and your knee will come up a little higher, but I bet you're going to ride just fine. So see how it goes. Go for a ride up and down the back road. Don't come back. And okay, up. let's see Phil take off. If there should ever be a storm or a pouring rain, wait a look out through the window pane where the sun will shine on. And Phil, stay awake. Well, should we start over here? No. <laughs> yeah? It's a six inch sewer pipe. PVC. P that's it, PVC. Sounds so much better. See, I'm, I told you I was no good at marketing. <laughs> it's new though, it's new, it's new pipe. The expansive, massive Bicycle Man Warehouse. Well, I don't know about expansive. <laughs> TerraCycle does gorgeous work. They have a really nice milling machine and they know how to make chips. <laughs> you know who the sponsor of uh, LBR or LBS is? Let me think, who could that be, Pat? <laughs>